box. And I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't anything there, but I, I've never yeah. heard a good rationale other than toxic is a bad word and I don't want to be toxic and so I'm detoxing and that sounds like something that was good for me. And fasting or whatever it is does have a lot of benefits, but yeah, you, you kind of already said it, like what, what are you detoxing? Yeah, and I, that was always been my answer up until probably like about four months ago and I went to, I was in Costa Rica with Dr. Ben House and uh, Dr. Brian Walsh and he gave a really great talk on a uh, detoxification protocol he has and showing a lot of the literature showing that yeah, the testing, eh, we don't really know the best testing forms, at least at a consumer level, but there's very good research to show that we're probably exposed to more toxins now than we ever have been before. The caveat also being that a lot of them are stored in fat tissue. So if you have someone who's not really releasing a lot of that fat tissue, right, so their calories are not low, they're not kind of actively dieting, right. it's probably not really going to show up even if you ran a blood test or something like that. But now if you have someone doing a dieting protocol, so his analysis was that everyone he has that he has do more caloric restriction, he'll have them do some type of quote-unquote detox in a very specific way because a lot of those compounds are probably just getting released at that point. Um, so I'd say probably look at his stuff. He's done a lot more work on that than I have. But I would say he's the only person so far that kind of changed my mind on that because a lot of the other detox people I would hear, I'm like, well, well what toxin is it? Just the toxins, man, the toxins. I'm like, I agree. We probably live in a very toxic environment, but what is the data showing that that is happening at a prevalent rate? And then what are the specific toxins? Um, so we had a whole list of different, you know, endocrine disruptors and other ones that uh, has been shown in the literature that most likely are present in the environment, uh, are present in uh, tissue to a high degree. You mentioned a couple times, uh, talked about mushrooms. And yeah. I feel like the more I learn about mushrooms, it's almost like it's, you can lump all the vegetables together and then mushrooms kind of yeah. have their own category in this thing. And they, they have like a really, uh, I don't know, more, more fundamental systemic approach to, or not even approach, but, um, result in our body. Um, what is there like a, a combination of mushrooms or certain types that yeah. people should be consuming regularly? Yeah. So initially I never looked at it, like I mentioned, and then, um, like blood so we were together probably a year and a half ago, started mentioning about mushrooms. That's different. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the really crazy ones. Um, which is funny cause at first when he mentioned it, that's exactly what I thought he was talking about. He's like, no medicinal mushrooms. I'm like, Oh, you mean the other kind? Yeah. Oh, okay. the other medicinal ones. <laughs> the other medicinal ones. <laughs> um, and like all things, I'm like, ah, I gotta go look at and see what the research is. And the research on them, especially with like research, and some of those is, like I mentioned, pretty impressive. It's it's harder because it, it goes a little bit against the way that kind of Western research is done, right? So Western research is very heavily influenced by pharmaceutical. We want X compound to target only Y receptor, and we only want it to target that one receptor. But to make those type of compounds is almost, I'd say at this point, virtually impossible because everything has some type of side effect. Where mushrooms have, I think, a lot of different uh, systemic effects that are useful. Different types of mushrooms have probably different types of effects. Um, I've talked to if people who are at the booth here, Jeff Chilton, who runs Namix. Um, super knowledgeable guy about uh, mushrooms. I actually was going to do a mushroom supplement probably almost nine months ago now. And I had the supplier, I had everything down. And there was one study that showed that it was effective. Um, but after talking to Jeff and some other experts, you can basically take what's called the fruiting body or the top portion of the mushroom, or you can kind of take the quote unquote, the, the root or the mycelium portion. And they have two very, very different properties. The fruiting body appears to have probably most of the effect and the mycelium portion at this point, probably not nearly as much of an effect. But a lot of times what they'll do is they'll grow it on rice, and they'll grow the mycelium portion, but they'll call it a mushroom extract, which, yeah, it's kind of true. It came from a mushroom and that type of thing. Um, so I think the sourcing makes a huge difference. And then different types of mushrooms appear to have different types of effects. The favorite ones I like, um, uh, Rishi is probably my favorite. Um, Chaga's pretty good. Chaga's actually a canker that grows on birch trees. 
And then mm, there's some interesting stuff on cordyceps. Um, it's not the super effective as people here, right? You may have heard back in the, God, it was 20 some years ago, like cordyceps mushroom was like the supposedly yeah, secret huge. Russian herb, whatever. And yeah, those studies were, it's not for that endurance. positive. For, for endurance. endurance. Yeah, yeah. They, they talked a lot about the uh, people climbing in the Himalayas. Right. Uh, utilizing cordyceps to increase their overall oxygen. Yeah, and the, the actual cordyceps that comes off of a fuzzy caterpillar is just ungodly expensive. No one can afford it. Uh, but they do have a subtype. It's called cordyceps militaris. Um, does have some studies showing that it may have some positive effects. Again, like all most supplements, even when you say positive effects, you're, you're still talking in like the single digit uh, percentage. Yeah. Um, but I think even just adding more mushrooms to people's diets is probably an area I think I overlooked for a period of time. And we know like the beta-glucans, there's a very good response to those, all the different components that go into it. It initially kind of got thrown out by nutritionists, just like, ah, there's almost no calories in them, there isn't much in them. Yeah. Right. And if you look at like the vitamin and mineral profile, it's not super impressive. But the more we look at the different compounds, like I mentioned, beta-glucans and other ones, we're finding more and more uh, beneficial effects from them. Well, I've even seen that white button mushrooms um, uh, assist in estrogen suppression. Potentially, yeah. yeah I haven't seen that one, but yeah, it wouldn't really surprise me. Yeah, there's uh, there's been some studies I've seen that had pretty good evidence. With cool. Like, uh, not, it's it's not dim, like uh, that's found in vegetables. But yep. It's something with Yeah, dim is from broccoli, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right on. To oh, what ex- real yeah. quick, to you what extent it. do you feel like we <laughs> just have We can keep discovered. going for a, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, you want to sleep over? <laughs> 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 Come over uh, to the house. <laughs> <laughs> like you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's so many compounds in broccoli or whatever it is. Like someone told me like there's, you know, 250 different things in milk or whatever. Yeah. Like to what extent do you feel like we just don't know what the hell is really in our food? Like are there like, do you think there's probably like entire categories of nutrients we haven't even discovered yet? My guess is yeah, you know, because the more I keep studying stuff, the more I'm just like, oh man, I don't, I don't even know if I know anything, right. you know, because one study agrees, one disagrees, and then oh, it's only on this isolated compound. Um, not to be kind of the the Debbie Downer, but doing research on broccoli is just really unsexy and not that novel either. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's it's hard to do. I think more of the basic research. I think a way to get around it maybe doing uh, genetics research on top of like nutrigenomics research. That's a little bit more sexy and probably an easier sell also. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like basic research, I don't think there's as much going in as there probably should be. And then also on the psychological side, which is not where I work a lot, but how do we take the things that we know are beneficial and get people to eat more of them, right? Eat more vegetables, eat other things that we know are beneficial. And that's a whole separate uh, subtopic itself. And then if you add in, like you mentioned, well, broccoli alone, all the different potential synergies or additive effects. If people don't need to eat broccoli alone, they eat different vegetables, eat different things with it. Uh, we know that eating some fat may help some things with absorption, may not help others. Cooking may help some things, may hurt other things, you know, so then you get into all those different different discrepancies too. And the last thing related on that for micronutrients and stress, uh, Julia Rutledge did some really interesting research where she took, okay, um, in New Zealand where they had the big earthquake, and then a couple of years ago when they had the North Dakota as a big flood, they actually had researchers went out in, in, in rowboats and separated the population and gave half the population uh, micronutrient multivitamin that was already mixed and everything. So super high amounts of micronutrients and everything and gave a placebo to the other group. They did this after the earthquake also. And their thought being, okay, here's a massive stressor that's applying to everybody in this area. Do people who get more micronutrients, do they actually do better than the group who didn't? And they've done, I think, like two or three studies now and showed that the micronutrient group does do better. And that's not what you would expect if you looked at the studies done on the single ingredients in it. So if you pull out the single ingredients and only look at like the vitamin E study or just the vitamin um, D study or other ones, they're not all super uh, positive. So I hope that research is getting to the point where we're trying to take all these things together and look at the uh, effects instead of trying to take this one little thing out and looking for the single factor thing of what it's affecting. Right. And that's getting us closer back to your question about, you know, all the different compounds that are actually in food. So it's getting us that next step closer to trying to figure that out. 
instead of going this uber uber reductionist route down the rabbit hole of the next single compound that interfects the only one receptor in this subpopulation of the subpopulation. Right. It'd be kind of like like isolating one movement in a training program yeah. and giving someone like all you're doing is push-ups. Yeah. Does that make you a better athlete versus like a comprehensive training program which would be like the multivitamin or or the combination. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add to that if people ask all the time, should I take a multivitamin? I usually tell them yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I mean, the data that... Like it doesn't hurt and it's cheap. It's just yeah. really, the, there was a data came out a couple of years ago that says, oh, multivitamins are horrible. It's like, yeah, not really. Yeah. You know, you're really not going to go so far over the edge you're going to have any effects. If anything, it's probably going to be a little bit better and shore up your own diet. doesn't appear to be a lot of big negative effects with it. Um, last thing on that, too, uh, Charlie Popper has presented some stuff. He's at Harvard showing that in his patients, he's a psychologist or psychiatrist, I believe, He'll start giving them a multi-nutrient blend first before he even touches any other types of meds. Um, and he said a lot of times for depression and even some pretty heavy uh, mental illnesses, he doesn't even use any other pharmaceuticals very rarely anymore. And he found just by giving him super high doses of a of combined formula that his use of pharmaceutical drugs has gone down pretty dramatically. So that even in a different realm, again, it's a disease population, but that more data just suggests that looking at the whole first, seeing how far we can get with that, and then going only reductionist if we needed to. Dig it. This has been incredible. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been fun. Uh, There's a few times that we get to go this long and learn so much all with one person. So really appreciate the time. No, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Where can people find you? Uh, yep, so two sites. Uh, one is just MikeTNelson.com, M-I-K-E-T-N-E-L-S-O-N. So I go to that forum. Most of my content goes out over my 